Good morning, and welcome to Christ Church on this third Sunday of the Epiphany. Our Gospel reading is taken from Mark's Gospel, chapter 1, beginning with verse 14. Now, after John had been taken into custody, Jesus came into Galilee, preaching the gospel of God, and saying, The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. As he was going along by the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon, casting a net into the sea for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. Going on a little farther, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who were also in the boat mending their nets. Immediately, Jesus called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants and went away to follow him. This is the gospel of Christ. I want to talk this morning about covenant. And covenant is a concept that I confess I had no knowledge of growing up in the Episcopal Church. I think probably those of you who come from Presbyterian backgrounds will have a better idea of covenant than most of us Episcopalians had. But covenant was something I didn't understand, uh, was never explained to me, and until I began to read the scripture for myself, I didn't realize what a covenant was. But we find several covenants in scripture. Uh, we have the covenant that God made with Noah. We have the covenant that God made with Abraham. We have the covenant that God made with Moses on Mount Sinai. We have the promise, prophetically, in Jeremiah 31, of the new covenant that God will make with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. And we have Jesus at the Last Supper proclaiming that that new covenant will be inaugurated through his death on the cross the next day. So, Scripture is full of covenant. I want us to think about what a covenant is. Well, a covenant is something that God initiates. We don't go to God and say, God, I would like to uh, have an agreement with you. God is the one who is the initiator of the covenant. He is the one who guarantees the covenant because he is the only one who has the power to guarantee the covenant. And this is based upon the fact that, number one, he's got the power, but number two, God is faithful. He never fails to fulfill his word. So when God offers a covenant or presents a covenant to be entered into, he is the one who initiates that, but he's the one who guarantees that, and he is the one who will see that covenant through until the end. In our Old Testament reading from Jeremiah today, uh, we have the, the reminder of Israel's faithlessness and the fact that even though God had made a covenant, both with Abraham and later with Moses, that Israel was not faithful to that covenant, that they had turned their backs on God, that they had backslidden and uh, were in need of, of returning to the Lord, were in need of repentance. And at the beginning of uh, chapter 4 of Jeremiah, we read today, If you will return, O Israel, declares the Lord, then you should return to me. And if you will put away your detested things, that is the idolatrous practice that they had adopted, the, if you will put those things away from my presence and will not waver, and you will swear as the Lord lives in truth, in justice, and in righteousness, then the nations will bless themselves in him, and in him they will glory. So the Lord is calling Israel to repentance. Israel had um, outwardly trusted in the sign of the covenant, which was given to Abraham when God made that covenant with Abraham. And what was that sign? I have to go back to Genesis chapter 17. That sign was uh, circumcision. 
and it was outward and visible. You know, the definition of a sacrament in the 39 articles is an outward and visible sign of an inward and spiritual grace. So in the Old Covenant, the, the sign, the symbol, the sacrament was circumcision. But that wasn't enough. Because what God was interested in was not just an outward sign, but he was more interested in the inward and spiritual grace. Now, if you've joined us on Tuesday night, I'm going to make a plug for Tuesday night. Please join us. We send out an email on Tuesday mornings inviting everyone to come. It's done on Zoom, and we are in the book of Romans, which is probably, if you had to pick one book of the Bible to say this one book has been the most influential on human history, it would be Romans. Because in Romans, Paul goes into a great deal of detail about covenant, about the covenant that God made with Abraham, which preceded the covenant of the law, the giving of the law on Mount Sinai to Moses. And the basis of this covenant was Abraham's response in faith. Abraham believed God, we're told, in Genesis 12, and it was reckoned to him or counted toward him as righteousness. So it was the fact that, that Abraham, who didn't have any of the things that we've got, he didn't have a Bible, he didn't have a, a faithful community to relate to, he simply had the call of God, but he believed, he trusted, he responded in faith, and he set out from his home into the unknown. He was responding to God's call. And God said, I will lead you and show you the place that I have given to you and to your descendants. So Abraham has ups and downs in his faith relationship with God. And one of the downs was when he got tired of waiting on God. God had promised him a son who would be the heir of the covenant. And Abraham was getting old. Sarah was old, past the age of childbearing. And Abraham said, this is not going to work. And so with agreement of his wife, Sarah, he goes into his, his maid, Hagar, and they produce a son called Ishmael. Ishmael was not the child of the promise. He was the child of Abraham's impatience, and in a sense of Abraham's faithlessness. So in Genesis chapter 17, Abraham must be thinking, you know, Ishmael is, is uh, the child who will inherit everything. He's 99 years old, and the Lord appears to Abraham again, and he said, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless. I will establish my covenant, that's the covenant that he made with him in Genesis chapter 12, between me and you, and I will multiply you exceedingly. Abram fell on his face, and God talked with him, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with you, and you will be a father of a multitude of nations. Your, no, your name shall no longer be called Avram in Hebrew, which means exalted father, but your name shall be called Avraham, which means the father of the nation. For I will make you the father of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful. I will make nations come forth from you and kings will come forth from you. I will establish my covenant is that word again, brit in Hebrew. I will establish my brit between me and you and your descendants after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant. I'll say that again. It's not a temporary covenant. It's an everlasting covenant. The Abrahamic covenant is everlasting. The expression used in Hebrew means in perpetuity. Ad olam. There's no time limit to it. I will establish this covenant as an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your descendants after you. 
I will give to you and to your descendants after you the land of your sojournings. That is the land of Israel. All the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession. And I will be their God. Again, that word everlasting. It's not a temporary gift of the land. It is an everlasting gift of the land. God said further to Abram, now, as for you, you shall keep my covenant, you and your descendants after you. This is my covenant, which you shall keep, between me and you and your descendants after you. Every male among you shall be circumcised. That was the outward and visible sign of the inward and spiritual grace of the covenant. Now, what was Abraham's response? Well, he couldn't believe it. And uh, he tells Sarah, she laughs, he laughs, and... Abraham fell on his face and laughed, it says, and said in his heart, Will the child be born to a man a hundred years old? And will Sarah, who is ninety years old, bear a child? And Abram said to God, Oh, that Ishmael might live before me. He's going back to his faithless act of having a child with Hagar. And he's asking God, to fulfill this covenant through Ishmael. And what is God's response? He said, no. But Sarah, your wife, will bear you a son, and you shall call his name Yitzhak. Isaac, we say in English. Yitzhak means he laughs. And I will establish my covenant with him, as an everlasting covenant. Again, ad olam, in perpetuity, for his descendants after him. As for Ishmael, and this shows God's great mercy, even though Ishmael was not God's plan A, God nevertheless blesses Ishmael. He said, I've heard you, and behold, I will bless him, and I will make him fruitful and will multiply him exceedingly. He shall become the father of 12 princes and I will make him a great nation. But my covenant, my breach, I will establish with Yitzhak, with Isaac, whom Sarah will bear to you at this season next year. This is God's fulfillment of the original call that he placed on Abram's life in Genesis chapter 12. God promised that through his descendants, his physical descendants, he would bring blessing to the earth. And of course, ultimately, through the physical descendants of Abraham comes Yeshua HaNotzri, Jesus the Messiah, who brings blessing to the earth in the form of a new covenant which is promised in Jeremiah 31. Jesus came to fulfill all the promises of God. We're told he came in the fullness of time at just the right time. Jesus appears, born of a woman, born is the same way that all of us are born, and he comes into this world. But the principle of the covenant and how the covenant is entered into rest on Abraham, and that covenant is entered into by faith. Abraham believed God, and Paul in Romans goes into a great deal of detail about this. It was Abraham's faith that justified him. It was Abraham's faith response to God's promise to his offer of the covenant that allowed Abraham to come into a personal relationship with him. And that principle of faith is still the principle whereby we enter into the new covenant. And all of us have been called to come into that new covenant. In our gospel reading this morning, we read of Jesus beginning to proclaim the gospel. And his message was simple and straightforward. He said, the kingdom of God is at hand meaning that he came to bring, to usher in the new covenant. 
whereby our sins could be forgiven, not just ritually forgiven, as in the old covenant with the offer of an animal sacrifice, but permanently forgiven. And the response for entering into that covenant is the same response that Abraham had. We have to respond in faith. That's God's call to us. And this covenant is extended far beyond the house of Israel and the house of Judah. As we read in Jeremiah 31, it's made initially with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. That's why Jesus said, I came first and foremost to save the lost sheep of the house of Israel. It's why Paul in the beginning of Romans said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It's the power of God unto salvation for all who believe, for the Jew first and also for the non-Jew, for the Gentile. We have been called and grafted in, according to Ephesians and Romans 11. We've been grafted in as a wild olive branch into this new covenant that God promises and that really is what Jesus is saying when he says the kingdom of God is at hand. The kingdom of God is here. It's not here in its fullness yet. Jesus came to bring the kingdom, to usher in the kingdom. And when we come into a relationship with him, our citizenship is now in heaven. We are subjects, not citizens. We are subjects of the kingdom of God. We belong to him. That's our first and foremost allegiance. Someone was asking me the other day, they were distraught about the political situation. We're not to be distraught about anything in this world because our citizenship or our subjectship is in heaven. We belong to another kingdom. And that citizenship, that subjectship cannot be taken away. It's permanent. The moment we enter into God's new covenant, by responding in faith to the offer that he's made to us in the person of his son, Jesus. We become citizens. We've been translated, as Paul says, out of the kingdom of darkness, that is the kingdom of Satan, which we're all born into as a result of the fall, into the kingdom of his marvelous light. And so we have a new citizenship. We have a new identity. We have new promises that we can rest in, according to Hebrews. We've entered into the Shabbat rest or the Sabbath rest of God by virtue of the fact that we've come into this covenant. We can not only rest in it, we can rejoice in it because we know as God promised to Abraham's physical descendants that his covenant with Abraham and his descendants through Isaac was in perpetuity. His promise to us as we come into the new covenant is that we are citizens of God forever. That he will not let go of us, that we are his, that we belong to him. And as we read last Tuesday night in our study of Romans, if we have been saved by what Jesus did for us on the cross, by his death on the cross and his resurrection from the dead, how much more are we now being saved by his life? Because Jesus is now at the right hand of the Father, making intercession for us. And we can now call ourselves the children of God. And we can rejoice and rest in that identity. That's the good news. That's why we need to rejoice this Sunday. We need to be excited. I was reading... Uh, I am reading a fascinating book about the uh, history of four different settlements that occurred in British America from different parts of Britain and the different uh, characteristics of each one of them. And one of them was fascinating because it said that the, um, the one thing that Anglican clergy was speaking about Virginia, the one thing that the Anglican clergy feared the most was something called enthusiasm in worship. You see, enthusiasm was practiced by some of the people that lived in the backwoods who came from, the, from Northern Ireland, from, uh, from uh, Ulster. 
and from uh, Northern Britain. These were not the refined people. This was the back country. But these people experienced revival, and when they experienced revival, they weren't ashamed to show some emotion. And the Anglicans were scared of that. They said, that's enthusiasm. Well, I know a lot of Anglicans who, Episcopalians uh, and Presbyterians, who get excited about things. It's usually football games, sometimes other stuff. But I think the Lord wants us to be excited. I think he wants us to be enthusiastic about the covenant that he has made with us in the person of his son, Jesus. That we can rejoice in that, we can celebrate that. And that's what we do every Sunday morning. We do something called the Eucharist, which in Greek means thanksgiving. We're offering thanks to God. We're praising him for who he is and what he's done for us in the person of his son, Jesus. That's what true worship is. And I would encourage all of us this morning to remind ourselves of the principles of covenant, that God initiates the covenant and we respond to what he's initiated. And even that response is his grace. Apart from his grace, we can do nothing. We can't even respond. We can't even believe. But we're told in Ephesians that God has lavished that grace upon us. And that grace is present here today. And the offer of coming into his covenant is made by him today to all of us. And just as he was calling out to Israel, who had come into that covenant but wandered away from it, he calls out to us today that if we've wandered away, if our love has grown cold, if we've found it hard to believe, and all of us go through those times when we find it hard to believe, and we, we feel like God is far away, far removed from us, but he never leaves us. He said, I will never leave you or forsake you. So he's with us here today, and he, he's calling us to come home. He's calling us to return, as he called Israel, into that covenant relationship with him, which he has secured for us through the blood of his son, Jesus. Amen.